power integrity, power rail measurements on an oscilloscope. Um, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us and learn a little bit about um, power rail measurements. Uh, my name is Dave Walter. I'm a channel a distribution channel manager based in Chicago. Um, I uh, helping facilitate this along with uh, with Ken, Kenny Johnson, who will be doing the presentation today. Um, we've put everybody on mute that's coming into the call, um, but uh, please, if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, uh, please enter them into the chat. Uh, we'll have a, a brief question and answer session at the uh, at the end of uh, the presentation. Um, also, uh, as we're going through, uh, please keep in mind um, if you have uh, any requests for demo or quotation afterward, please uh, uh, fill that into the questionnaire at the end. Um, and uh, I wanted to thank um, Test Equity, uh, who's partnering with us today to, to give this presentation. Um, and uh, with that, I know your time is valuable, so I don't want to talk any longer. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kenny Johnson. Great. Thanks. Hey, so uh, folks, I appreciate you joining. I'm pretty excited to uh, have a chance to share with you some uh, information about scopes and power integrity. And uh, let's just jump right in here. I want to give you a brief uh, uh, look at the agenda so you can kind of understand what we what we hope to accomplish. Okay, hopefully you can hear me now. It's I was muted, not sure why. Um, so the introduction here, um, what I want to do is uh, walk you through this, why, why you want to make good power rail measurements with your scope. So to start with, um, power rail quality is commonly referred to as power integrity. And we'll talk about some of the trends that we see going on in the world, uh, why there's this focus on power integrity, a little bit of theory behind uh, power integrity and, and power distribution networks, then jump into the real meat, which is uh, the power rail test flow. So this is uh, uh, a majority of the measurements that you'll probably consider to be important and hardware tools, software tools, things to automate this, and then just really brief uh, wrap up summary of what we learned. I don't think we're listening to you. I think you're on mute again. Gosh, sorry. Each time I advance a slide, it was putting me on mute. There we go. Okay. okay. Thanks. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, start off with this simple definition of power integrity, which uh, we refer to it as the study of the conversion, delivery, and consumption of DC power in your system. And the reason this is important is probably kind of obvious is that your product's functional reliability depends directly on the quality of the system power. And a term that you'll hear me use as I go through this is PDN. I want to make sure you're familiar with this. The PDN is the power distribution network. Uh, what you see there is a 3D model of a power distribution network from our uh, SI Pro and PI Pro simulation, but it shows you all the pieces that are in a PDN. And so the power distribution network is everything from the bulk DC uh, through the, the planes, the traces, the caps, the inductors, the connectors, the voltage regulation modules, everything right up to the gates on the IC that are being powered. That's the PDN. So the reason that we, uh, um, we have this uh, uh, focus on the PDN and power integrity is kind of the benefit of Moore's law. You know, we're, we're all enjoying the benefits of this, uh, you know, packing more transistors into a chip every couple of years. And uh, clearly the the easiest uh, example of this is your uh, your smartphone. You know, we've uh, we've got more features in a smaller space and it's more sophisticated and we expect better battery life and things like that. But all of this comes at kind of a cost. And what we see is that um, uh, as we increase IC density, the current density starts to show up. You get hot spots in the IC. 
and uh, that's a problem as well as just overall ability to uh, power the exploding number of devices around the world. The other thing is that as speeds increase, we need to uh, pay attention to the power rails. And so one of the trends we see is the number of power rails in a system uh, is ever increasing. Uh, for example, the, the scope that we'll be showing you today has 86 power rails in it. That's crazy, right? Um, the uh, uh, Many people, if you're working on an application that you're fortunate enough to have a power management IC that's uh, set up for it, will be using a PMIC. Uh, most of you are probably like me to where they don't make a PMIC for scopes, so we had to do all the power management ourselves. And uh, the one thing that you see that's uh, uh, kind of tough on all this is the supply tolerances are crushing. They're getting smaller and smaller. And the main reason that operating voltages are getting smaller and smaller is to reduce power. So you can think about in the past, we probably had something like um, a five volt rail and it had like a plus or minus 500 millivolts on it. That's pretty common, right? 10%. And uh, today, uh, it's pretty common to see rails that are around one volt. And obviously on that one volt, you can't have plus or minus 500 millivolts. You have to have something that uh, shrinks down proportionally, but it's not even 10%. It's pretty common right now to see on these rails something that's in the one to 3% kind of range. So the rails are getting smaller and tighter. And even if they're not shrinking, they're putting tighter tolerances on the bigger rails. And this is all to save power. Now, another reason for tightening up the rails though is power supply noise causes clock and data jitter in your system. So consider this, this could be the, uh, um, the input to a logic device, maybe output from a memory or something like that. And when the input goes high, it crosses that threshold and turns on the output. And so the, uh, the reference voltage that's powering these things is that varies. What that does is it affects that region or that uh, threshold and it isn't a crisp line anymore. It becomes sort of a, 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 it varies as the power rails vary. And so you end up with sort of a, a switching region. And so if the input is going high when you're on the low side of that, well, you turn on the output early. Conversely, if the input goes high when you're at the high side of that switching threshold, you turn on the output late. That is power supply to induce jitter. Another example is uh, in things like uh, CPUs, processors, uh, uh, clock buffers, things like that. Um, the propagation delay through the gates of the IC varies as the voltage changes. So consider this, I've got a uh, some kind of current load, you know, something turns on and there's a load, my supply is gonna drop because it can't instantaneously react to that. And then it's gonna spring back up and it's gonna kind of overshoot a little bit and then settle in. Well, while the voltage is low, that increases gate propagation delay. And when it's high, it decreases the propagation delay. And so these variations in power rails are affecting the uh, the timings and the delays through our devices. The end effect then is that if we can decrease power rail tolerances, we can reduce the amount of jitter in our system. And as we know, all of our systems are trying to shove more data through them faster, they're clocking faster, so that's another reason why they're crushing the power rail tolerances. So then, Kind of the question is, is well, where is all this noise coming from on those power rails? One of the most common places for the noise is on switching loads. If you consider that uh, device there where I show like it's a clock or a data line, when it goes from a zero to a one, uh, it creates a fairly sudden load on the supply and the supply can't react instantaneously. And so the supply will drop and then spring back up and recover. Then when I release that load, the supply springs up and back down and recovers. And so as we're clocking data and things like that, you'll see this uh, noise on the power rails, kind of this alternating spikes. And that's where the majority of the uh, uh, high frequency noise comes from. And these switching loads, um, they can cause extremely high frequency noise on the power rails, easily exceeding a gigahertz. And the thing that's important to consider here is that your power rail has to be stable. It's got to be supplying good quality DC 
from actual DC up to the bandwidth of those switching currents. So don't be lulled into thinking that uh, power integrity is a low bandwidth, low frequency measurement. Uh, in fact, in many cases, even if it's not affecting your supply jitter and stuff, you can start to have problems with EMI or polluting your radios and your devices. Ah, which brings me to my next one here. So the PDN is gonna be the biggest structure in your system, right? All these traces, these power planes and everything, it's carrying high current, and like I just showed you, it's carrying this high frequency noise. And so that can create EMI problems. You're gonna have uh, radiated emission problems, even if you don't have EMI problems, you're able to pass a certification, maybe you've got a really tight enclosure. If you've got radios in there, you're going to be polluting, you could be polluting your radios. So uh, again, if we can keep those that noise down, that gives us a better chance of passing EMI or not interfering with our own radios in our devices. Now here's a little bit of theory about how we do this. So you look at it, you see over there on the left that I've got my DC supply and it's got its tolerance window there. And as long as I color inside those lines, I'm good. If I color outside those lines, I've got a problem. Well, how do I design my system so that I know that I'm gonna stay inside the, the tolerance? Well, uh, there's this notion of PDN impedian, impedance. And so a target impedance. Now follow me on this is that you can think about it like kind of like the simple circuit diagram there to where we've got our supply and you've got your PDN and it's going to have an impedance, um, you know, something complex. The impedance is going to change with frequency. And then we've got our device, which is a load. And so we've got current flowing through this system. And so what we can do then is we can say that if we know uh, we can determine a target impedance where we say, well, we know what the ripple the acceptable ripple is and so we divide that by current as a function of frequency and we can come up with the impedance as a function of frequency sounds simple right but knowing how the current is going to vary with frequency is kind of tough so there's a couple ways to estimate it one is that you could say well the transient frequency is about one half of the max frequency or the max current i'm sorry transient current is about one half the max current that you'll that your device is rated for um, another way to get that max current is that you know the, the power that your uh, device is supposed to be using, the peak power that it'll use. And so that could, you can take the, the peak power, divide it by uh, the VDD, and you can come up with the peak power. That gives you that max. You can plug it in and into these other equations. And so you can see here that you can kind of estimate this target impedance. The point is, is that you're going to try to design the PDN so you've got this impedance below that so that if there's current, uh, flowing at a freq with frequency content close to one of these spikes, you still won't create a voltage that's beyond those tolerances. And really kind of the way we do this is, of course, there's the layout of the planes and, and the traces and stuff like that, but um, a lot of the way we affect this impedance is by using capacitors. And what happens is that the power planes or traces that you have Sure, those have low impedance at DC, but as the frequency goes up, those are inductors. And so the impedance is going to rise up. And so once the impedance of those starts to rise up and get above or approach our target impedance, the way we lower that impedance is by putting on a capacitor that has um, uh, that will uh, have effect at that frequency range. But the capacitor itself isn't perfectly a capacitor. It's got its own self-resistance and self-inductance. So over time, it will begin to look inductive and we have to put down another capacitor. And so you have this series of capacitors on the board from you know fairly large to middle size to small ones as you get closer to your device and everything that are all intended to help keep that impedance at that target range. So if we've done our job right, this well-designed PDN is going to help keep those supply tolerances, those supplies within tolerance from DC up to the switching currents. That's going to help us with, we talked about with power consumption and with the power supply induced jitter, it's going to minimize EMI problems. So the primary validation task, if we want to go through and make sure that our PDN is designed right, is to validate the power rail quality. It's to go look at power rail quality. Now, it's not always as easy as it seems 
here's kind of a system. This is just a hypothetical one. And you guys may know this for those of you that don't. This is illustrating how the number of power rails explodes. I kind of made this up. This isn't a real thing, but I say it can uh, run off of a battery. It could plug into a wall adapter or maybe go to a charging station, you know, a docking station kind of thing. And uh, we'll give it an application processor. I also gave it a, a GPS, a solid state drive, and some sensors, a temperature sensor and a camera. And you can see real quick how the number of rails explodes here. And in some cases, there's multiple redundant rails. And the reason for that is like, for example, on this 2.5 or this 1.8 that's going to the solid state drive and the camera is we don't want uh, a dynamic load from the camera to pollute the rail for the solid state drive. So when the camera is going to take a picture or a flash, it's going to yank on the supply. We want the supply to the solid state drive to be stable. So when I talk about like how that's the scope has 86 rails, it's not 86 different voltages, there's just a lot of redundant copies so we can isolate them from each other and try to keep the supplies as pure as possible. Now the other thing, you see some of these rails then are dynamic. Um, I show it's like a 1.8, 1.1 and 0 volts, you know, active standby and off. And so it's the job of the power integrity engineer to make sure that all these rails are within tolerance under all conditions and that the current loads, you know, are whether that's inrush or current for thermal or battery life and everything is within uh, specification under all conditions. And if it, that isn't bad enough, maybe you've got experience with this, but the majority of our devices have power sequence requirements. That is when the device powers up or powers down, the rails have to go up or down in a prescribed sequence. If they don't, we can end up in an unknown state. We can latch up or damage a device. And so it's important then to uh, also follow the power up and power down sequence. Uh, this timing diagram here that I showed was just an example of the power up sequence for a, uh, a DDR memory. Now, if you're fortunate enough to have an application that is relatively, I'll say, high volume, uh, then there might be a PMIC on the market. Some of the semiconductor manufacturers might make a power management IC that helps you with this. And you can see the power management IC has a lot of duties it can perform. Uh, most common is the people take advantage of the built-in uh, converters and the power management uh, or the sequencer. You also notice that the thing can talk to a host over some sort of a digital bus that helps uh, coordinate things like those standby and active voltages and off and things like that. And so uh, you can kind of think of the PMIC as being the, uh, the traffic control officer that's going to help with the, the power and power down sequencing and the sleep and standby of all these uh, power rails here. That's if you're lucky enough to have a PMIC. Many of us are working on applications that aren't mainstream enough to have PMICs, and so we have to take care of the sequencing and power management ourselves. Here is the typical test flow that I see then. When somebody gets back aboard, first thing they're going to do is they're going to pull out a multimeter and go around and check the supplies to make sure that they're about where they're supposed to be. Then they go through and they do this power up and power down sequencing hundreds of times, thousands of times. I've, I've encountered users that have uh, high reliability products where they have to actually do this power sequencing tens of thousands of times, very time consuming. Once we're convinced that the power up and power down sequencing is performing as it's supposed to, then and only then will we enable the rest of the system and go look at power up quality and current consumption and energy efficiency. Now it's also important to consider the effects of temperature on these systems. So most of us are probably gonna th go through and take our device and look at the power integrity, not just at room temperature, but also at cold and hot. And the reason for this is that at low temperature operation, um, things like the capacitors, for example, uh, their value changes. The electrolytic capacitors, the electrolyte in there becomes more viscous with temperature and that changes uh, the capacitance and therefore that affects the capacitor's ability to either store energy or to effectively filter things. And so uh, 
you might have had an experience where like, yeah, at low temperature, um, our radios, you know, in our device, you know, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or whatever, are uh, are experiencing interference. And that's because of uh, at low temperatures, the capacitors don't filter as well. At high temperature, for example, the problem is more one of uh, self-induced heating of the power supplies. The power supplies themselves are not 100% efficient. And as their temperature goes up, their efficiency decreases. So at high temperature, it's def efficiency drop. That means it's using up more of the power in terms of heat, which makes its temperature goes up, which means it becomes less efficient, which makes its temperature go up. And so if we don't go through and double check the high point of this and everything, we could end up with a thermal runaway, or at a minimum, we're going to decrease the operational lifetime of our part because certain parts in there are going to be operating uh, near or above their maximum. Now, as we go forward, I'm going to show you some um, actual measurements on the scope. And uh, the scopes that uh, are, were used for this today were a combination of our MXR and EXR series oscilloscopes. Uh, the reason we chose these for this is, as you can see, uh, first, that the scope is available in an eight-channel version, and that's fantastic because when you're looking at power rails, the more channels, the better. And uh, uh, there's some other uh, built-in applications and features in the scope that we take advantage of when we're doing, uh, excuse me, when we're doing uh, power uh, management kind of work. For example, the built-in DVM, that's pretty handy. Uh, some of the protocol analysis, we'll use the waveform generator for some of our measurements, and we actually also use the digital channels for some of the measurements. So I just wanted you to know, though, that this is the scope that we use during these uh, measurements today. So starting off with our uh, test flow, we've got power good. Well, here's what I do, actually, is that I know that the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hook up a bunch of probes to my device because I'm going to be doing power sequencing testing. And rather than probe once with the multimeter and then a second time with the scope, is I just hook up the scope and use the built-in DVM on the scope to actually make the measurements. And the DVM is a separate measurement. It's not the same uh, measurement system that's plotting on the screen. It's a separate actual measurement behind the, uh, the BNC there. So the channel doesn't have to be active and the scope doesn't have to be running and acquiring. But I can ask the scope, I can say, okay, What's the voltage on channel one? What's the vol and I can just ask it then. What's the voltage on channel two, channel three, channel four? You get the idea. I can walk through real quick and it'll tell me what my operating voltages are. And it saves me a step of actually having to use the, uh, the DVM. So it's just like using the DVM, but it's one less piece of equipment I gotta have or that I gotta go probing around with. The next thing is the power up and power down sequence. Now, again, I said that this could be an extremely painful experience, and here's how most people do it today. Uh, I'm going to use an example of eight power rails and a four-channel scope. So what users typically do then is they will take their four most important rails, and they will assign those to analog inputs. And then they will assign the other four rails to the digital inputs of the scope, the MSO channels. They will put the analog inputs into infinite persistence. Infinite persistence is where the scope uh, overlays subsequent acquisitions on top of each other and kind of builds up these fatter traces where it, where it sees variations. They will go through and put um, a mask on their most important channel, and then they will go through and run their power sequencing testing the 10 or 100 or 1,000 times that they have to do it under all the different conditions, you know, uh, emergency power down, uh, low battery, user requested power down, that kind of stuff. But you can see right away some of the deficiencies in this. First is that with the digital channels, you don't have any analog information. So you don't know if that edge was actually, you know, uh, was it a slow rising edge? Was it non-monotonic? Did it skip? So that's not very helpful. And there isn't really, uh, run-to-run -run statistics on this, you know, in terms of how much it varied. Now, with key site scopes, um, you actually do have infinite persistence on the digital channels. So we will show you the run-to-run -run variations. Um, you can't do that with uh, other scopes, but you can't do that with the key site scopes. Um, but the issues here is that it's uncertain and it's time consuming. And, you know, since you don't get the run-to-run -run variations, it's it's tough to to notice. So you might have to go through and rerun some of those channels up on the analog inputs. 
Now on the analog inputs, the infinite persistence is nice, but you don't get a count of how many times something happened. For example, if I look at like uh, the red trace there, channel four, okay, it came up late and it came up really late. Well, I don't know if it did that once or if it did it, did it do it 10 times, it just overlays it. So there's no count there. So what I have to do is I have to go manually place markers on there and make measurements to make sure that I have a pass or a fail. So that's time consuming and it's it's open to human error. So, you know, it's it's better than nothing, right? But really what you want is something like the mass test. So that channel that we put the mass testing on, that's great because that mask clearly identifies uh, passes and fails. And that mask is, uh, it represents the tolerance in your power up and power down uh, sequence specification. So a very, uh, a violation is a violation and it counts the number of violations, it highlights them, you can see what they are. And so the issue is, is that most scopes only have one mask available to them. Now, on the MXR and the EXR though, we have a mask for every channel and we have the ability to perform auto masking on all those channels to save time. So I'm gonna show you here real quick, uh, just a quick demo here. This is actually, um, a, a video of me running the scope here so I didn't have to move around probes. And so I'll go over to analysis and I come down to mask test. And when it brings up the mask test, you can see that there's four tabs across there, one for each input of the scope. And I can go through and when I enable the mask test, what it'll do is it'll bring up a dialog box for me where I can decide if I wanna auto mask or create the masks. When I auto mask, what I'm doing is I'm specifying a tolerance, a vertical and a horizontal tolerance for the scope to use as the mask. And then when I tell it to create the mask, it automatically generates it. And I can do that for every channel, the same tolerance, different channels, whatever I want. I can also manually create masks using polygons, some multi-sided polygon um, that I stretch around. And this is helpful if I've got some kind of weird exotic shape. Once I've got all the channels masked, and then I can go through and I can tell the scope to take an action on this. And so what it could do is, uh, you know, uh, uh, run forever or run for a certain number of times. In this case, I'm going to tell it to run for, say, a thousand cycles. So it'll go make this measurement for a thousand cycles. And then when it finds a failure, I can tell it to do some sort of action. I like to tell it to do something like uh, maybe a... Uh, uh, save a screenshot or save a composite so I can see what was actually going on when that failure was other channels failing at the same time things like that and then I would just tell it to start and it'll go off and start running for that number of cycles but before I do that the other thing that I like to do is make use of some automated measurements and so I go into add measurements and I'll make use of our delta time measurements because that's the measurement that's specified also in the uh, timing specification. And so I tell it to go through and go from like say the middle or the upper or the lower or a threshold from, in this case, channel one to channel two. Uh, I'm treating channel one as my anchor. Then once I've got it all hooked up and ready to go, then I would press start. I've got my automated measurements, my masks, and I tell it to start. And as it starts running the test, You'll see down there in the lower right as it, it'll, uh, the number of waveforms will start to uh, increment, the number will go up, and I artificially create some failures here. So I think I make one of them come on a little early and turn off a little late. And when it does that, you can see the failure, the failure is highlighted. It counts the number of failed waveforms, tells you which polygon it failed on. And so the point is, is that when we're all done with this, We've got a complete screenshot that um, that tells us exactly everything about our testing. So we can see the, the mass that we tested to, we can see the failures, we can see how many tests we ran, how many failures there were. Some of them had three failures, others had one failure. We can see the statistics on the delta time which will give us some uh, statistical confidence for if there would ever be a failure if we ran for more and more cycles. So in one picture here, I've got my complete power sequencing test report. Now, 
if you do have to dive in and do some debug, remember I told you that the uh, uh, PMIX will talk to the host through some sort of digital bus, usually I squared C or some version of that, or like an, uh, a power management bus. Uh, in this case, I'm showing an SPMI example, and uh, we're just tracking the SPMI bus as we try to negotiate a sleep state to see what was happening in the system during the sleep state. I'm not going to dig into this. I just want to show you that there's other tools then that you can use if you're having problems with power sequencing to try to get to the root of the problem. So now once we've gone through and we've decided our rails are good and they're coming up and going down the way they're supposed to, let's go look at power rail quality. Oops, I went backwards. Sorry, folks. My bad. Huh. Okay, well, um, so with the power rail quality, um, what I wanted to point out there is that um, the tendency for people will be to use a typical probe, uh, your everyday 10 to 1 probe, whether it's a passive probe or an active probe. That's not the right thing to do. You want to use a power rail probe when you're doing this. Now, we've spent a lot of time Talking about power probes, the power rail probes themselves, there's uh, entire webinars and application notes on this. The thing you want to realize is that a power rail probe is an active probe, so it has things like offset control, but it's got one to one attenuation. That means you can go through and zoom in on the power rail and go down to the smallest volts per division, the highest sensitivity on your scope, and it will be the lowest noise measurement possible on your scope. So a power rail probe is the way to go. Keysight has two of them, a two gigahertz version. Oops, I bumped it. A two gigahertz version and a six gigahertz version. And there's a whole variety of ways to hook them up. The standard way is to connect it to one of the bypass caps using what is called a pigtail. It's just a coax where we've exposed the center conductor and we connect the center conductor to the hot side and the ground to the, uh, the ground side of the bypass cap. This has a very, very uh, short loop area here, so external noise doesn't couple into it. And in fact, because the inductance of that ground connection is so low, it actually has uh, substantial common mode rejection capability. So this is kind of the gold standard for doing it. But not everybody wants to go through and solder coaxes to bypass caps. So uh, we actually do supply things like uh, a browser. It looks just like a passive probe. It's not a passive probe, but it's a connection that looks like it. It has all the accessories. You can go through and browse your target in various different ways. I like using this little clip that I can clip onto the bypass caps. It's got reasonable bandwidth and everything. And so the typical approach is maybe go around with the browser. If you find something that looks concerning, then dig into it with something like the pigtail. Now, the best... Uh, handheld approach to this though are these browsers. We've got two browsers, a 7032 and a 7033. These actually have four and five gigahertz bandwidth respectively. And the way they do that is they have very, very small tips. And the reason they have small tips is because they're optimized for probing at 0805, 0603 IC uh, uh, caps or 0402, 021 package caps. And uh, it's got a little uh, spring on the ground and then the center conductor has this kind of chisel shape and so that spring loaded ground means you can kind of twist it around to adjust for different sizes and you don't have to have super steady hands and uh, these are also available and so um, you can get similar results with this and the pigtail coax it's just that this doesn't offer hands-free which the pigtail does now I want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, analysis applications that are available to you. So you're using your power rail probe, you're going out, you're looking at power rails, you find something and you say, wow, I've got some, uh, some problems. How do I address this? Well, one of the first things that uh, you could do is you could use our power integrity analysis app. This is an app that helps you understand power rail noise sources and the power rail noise effects. And I'm just going to give you a couple examples of this real quick. So here is me using a power rail probe to measure a output of a voltage regulator on its little eval board. Okay. Now that's what it looks like on the eval board. Now, when I look at it on my system, this is that same rail. And I'm like, huh, 
okay. Um, now I've got the benefit of seeing that on the eval board, but let's say you just walked up in your probe and uh, um, that rail and you look at that, what we tell users to do is like, okay, if you suspect that there's excess noise on there, the first thing you should do is put up an FFT. So I put up an FFT and what that does is it shows me the frequency content and I'll look for a fingerprint there of what might be causing the issues. In this case, I see a spike at 125 megahertz and I go, makes sense. That's the clocking frequency of the digital circuit being powered by this power rail. So I bet this is some of that uh, um, uh, switching load that we were talking about, you know, writing, writing out ones and zeros. But the thing that I don't know is how much of this noise is the switching noise and how much of it is just the regulator or the layout of my board. Well, that's where this app comes in. So the app starts off with this where you, you've looked at this, you see this, you would start up the app and you say, you know what, I think my data is interfering with my power supply. And then you tell the app which channel you have your power rail ho probe hooked up to. And you take one of your other probes, you go hook it up to your data line you know, your clock line. And then it goes through and analyzes it and it shows you a before and after. So it's showing you the yellow is, this is what your power rail looks like. The green here is your clock line. The red up here is what your power rail would look like if you could better isolate it from the noise, uh, from the switching noise. And it also shows you the FFT and you can see where the 125 megahertz um, spike is gone. Now, if I pull back in that screenshot of my power rail on the uh, uh, eval board, you can see that the app did a very, very good job of saying, this is ideally as good as you could get your power rail to look like if you could get rid of those switching loads. So it's a good way for you to help to not only find out where the uh, noise is coming from, but also understand the magnitude of that noise. Now, and it also works the other direction. I just want to show you here what we're talking about. So in this case, I've got an FPGA, and um, we've got, uh, we're probing the uh, data line, and we're probing one of the supplies. And you can see the supply is the blue trace, the data line is the yellow trace. In the upper graticule there, it's just kind of zoomed out, and so you can see the noise on the uh, power rail. The power rail has about plus or minus 5% of noise on a 1.1 volt rail. That's not bad. That's a pretty good rail. Well, when I go through and I make an eye diagram, which is kind of the measure of the margin on that data line, I make the eye diagram and I can see what my eye width is. Then what I did is we actually changed the power rail itself. We, we, we changed out the, the supply, the different supply to where we've got three millivolts of peak to peak noise and we go run the eye measurement again. And what we see is that the eye measurement is 50% wider. Okay, so one, that illustrates power supply induced jitter, but two, it also shows me how much effect that power supply noise had on my serial data line. But that's not a reasonable experiment to run at your own lab, you know, to go through and, oh, let me rip out this regulator, rework the board and put in a different regulator. That's what the software app will do for you. So it does the same thing where we go through and we probe a power rail, we probe a data line, and this time we tell the app that we think the power rail is interfering with our, our data lines, and it will show you your original data line, it'll show you the data line with your power supply induced jitter removed, and it'll show you the before and after eye diagram. So right away, you can see, oh, well, if I went through and knocked down the noise on that power rail, I could buy back as much as 50% more margin on my eye. So if I'm, if I'm having issues, you know, it right away it gives you an idea of how much you could uh, improve things just with a push of a button before you go through and rework and relay out and retest and all that. Now, the next thing is there's also an uh, power analysis app, D9010 PWRA, which is a suite of 20 automated measurements that are focused on switch mode and linear power supplies. And you can see the measurements over there on the right. Um, I'm not going to go through them all, but what you'll notice is that uh, uh, they all come with a setup wizard that shows you how to, you know, automatically configures the scope and shows you how to connect your probes to it, and then you're off and running. A couple of these we'll talk about. For your power rails, um, one of the things is that we use a lot of switching regulators in there for our DC to DC converters. 
those regulators tend to have a feedback loop in them to help control the output. Well, one of the measures of goodness is the control loop response. We want to make sure that that feedback loop is stable, that it's not going to it's not going to oscillate. And the way we do that is we measure phase margin and gain margin. And phase margin is the difference in degrees when the gain crosses zero, and gain margin is the difference in dB when phase crosses zero. And when I go look at industry, what we see is typical phase margin for something that is, you know, military or ruggedized or a uh, high reliability type application, uh, they tend to like 60 degrees of phase margin or more. Commercial consumer applications are more in the 50 degree phase margin and less than 45 is concerning. Now for gain margin, we typically look for at least 10 dB of gain margin. Now, some folks tell me that, uh, you know, you might think that we wouldn't need to test the, uh, the margin on the feedback loop because we're using some sort of reference design from the manufacturer. But the problem is, is there's a couple of things. That manufacturer doesn't know all the details about our, our system. The other thing is that we want to make sure that we didn't make a mistake when we copied that reference design. You know, did we make a layout error or uh, was there a fabrication error or uh, maybe the, the wrong component or wrong tolerance on the component? So even when copying um, reference designs, it's good to go through and test this, just to make sure that there was no mistakes made. Here's how it works. This is me actually running the scope doing this. So I've got the scope running and you can see I've got three waveforms and uh, I'll explain to you why in a second. But what I do is I go over to analyze and I'm going to pull up our power analysis. And this is cool because I'm about to do frequency response measurements. These are typically things done with like a network analyzer and I'm about to do them with a the scope. And so I'm going to have it do the control loop analysis. And I could go through and connect it up myself since I know, but I'm going to use the setup wizard just so you can kind of see what's going on. So the setup wizard, um, it walks you through, okay, which measurement do you want to do? And then it's going to show you like uh, how to hook your probes up and how to, um, and explain to you exactly what's going on with the system. Then once you've got the probes hooked up, you tell it next and it'll say that it's going to be ready to go. Now, um, you can also go through and do things like um, change the sweep here. So we're gonna sweep it from DC up to some frequency for this control loop. Now we'll wanna specify a reasonable stop frequency so that we're within the, the bandwidth of the control loop. And we can also do things like change the amplitude of the signal that we inject so that we don't overdrive things. And so if you wanna do that, you can do that. Um, but anyways, then you go through and you, they set it up. You can see here where I've connected the probes, but I've also looking at the, I've got a third probe hooked up to the output of the power rail just so I can see what's going on to make sure the power rail maintains while going through the test. Then when I tell it to start, you can see how the scope goes through and starts moving things around. And it's changing the time base, the vertical, the number of samples, it's doing averaging, and it's also using FFTs to go through and try to discern the, um, uh, the signal amplitudes here, because a lot of times if it's noisy, it's easier to see it in the FFT. So once it does this, it's actually calculating this and gives me a tabular view and a graphical view and plots the point. And so then I've done my control loop response analysis. Very helpful. Now, another uh, measurement that's uh, kind of related to that is changing uh, In this case, we hook up a uh, voltage probe and a voltage probe, and you see the, the step load, and you see the supply, and what you're going to look for is how fast that supply recovers. And this gives you an example of what happens with the phase margin. So with about 50 degrees of margin, that looks like a proper recovery. You can see down here with um, on the lower right with something like five degrees of margin, how long that supply rings. And so that's one of the reasons why we want to go through and have good phase margin. And that's another measure of how good we did there was with that transient response. Now, another frequency response measurement that's uh, very popular is the power supply rejection ratio. Remember, I showed you in those um, on that uh, uh, made a product how there's a lot of different power rails. 
Well, that's because we're using the voltage regulators to clean up the supply. And so power supply rejection ratio is a measure of how well the, re the um, converter is smoothing out noise on its input from getting on its output. And you can see it's uh, defined as 20 log ripple in, ripple out. So again, we go through and we hook up the scope where uh, one analog channel is gonna look at the signal going in, the other channel is gonna look at the signal going out. We're gonna take the wave generator that's built into the scope. So it's the exact same kind of way we're doing it for the, for the Bode plot. We put it into uh, a, a line injector here, which um, you hook your power supply to. And what the line injector does, it just couples this AC signal on top of the supply. So the scope isn't powering your device, it's just used to copy that on there. So then uh, we go through and we sweep that frequency and the scope goes through and measures it and plots it and gives you a tabular and graphical view. And you can see your power supply rejection ratio. Setup's very similar, I won't go through that. Finally then, we're going to look at current consumption and energy efficiency. Our power integrity engineer is going to want to go through and look at that, uh, uh, those power rails. And this time he's wanting to see what's the current consumption look like. Uh, the tendency is probably to go grab a regular clamp on current probe. They're great probes, but you're not going to be well served by doing that. You'd be better served by using something like the high sensitivity current probes. And that's because a regular probe, you've got to cut the trace, put a big loop of wire on there. These probes are rather large. That loop of wire can affect your system and couple in the noise. And the currents that we're trying to measure are usually pretty small. And so these probes don't have the sensitivity or accuracy to measure those small signals. You're better off using something like the high sensitivity current probe uh, to go look at those. And I'll tell you about the high sensitivity current probe here real quick. What it is, is it's actually a selectable gain differential probe that just measures the voltage drop across the sense resistor. So you can use the sense resistor from one milliohm to one mega ohm. And the, what that means for the selectable gain is that the scope can measure currents as low as 100 nanoamps or maximum currents well over 100 amps. Uh, the maximum current really is limited by the power rating of your uh, current sensor resistor. It's got a 20,000 to one dynamic range, which means that you can go through and look at the sleep and standby current, as well as the inrush and active currents all in one screen. Now you see that it's two traces and the scope has two outputs. You don't need to use them both if you don't want to. You can just hook up the one, the main one that's got the control, and what happens then is that with that one, you can hook it up and you can say, I wanna do zoom in and it'll change the gain and you can see the sleep currents. And then with that one channel hooked up, you say, okay, I wanna see zoom out. It'll change the gain and you can look at the inrush or active currents. If you wanna look at them both at the same time, you hook up this other channel, which is just a passive connection to the scope. You can see them both simultaneously. We offer some tools for helping you uh, determine the range for various sense resistors if you're not familiar with this kind of stuff. There's multitude of ways to connect this. We've got a make before break header that uh, if you don't wanna put current sense resistors on your target, we've got users that have a lot of rails and the cumulative effect of many, many sense resistors is dissipating a lot of power on their target. So instead of putting the sense resistors on the target, they put these make before break and put the sense resistor in the probe. And so what it does is it's got a short in there. So the current's going through the connector then when you hook up the probe, it has a double path. It's going through the connector and through the probe until you fully insert it, and then it sends the current through the probe. So that way you can hot swap from spot to spot without ever interrupting the current, but you can have the, the sense resistor outside of your target. Um, you can also go through and put the sense resistors on your board, and you can probe it by you know, connecting up uh, uh, I, in this example, we use something like uh, multimeter needle probes, or you could solder wires to the probe. You can put the resistor actually on your target and put it in the probe and just solder wires to the, to the uh, like zero ohm resistor on the board that's jumping across the trace. You could design it in. The point is there's a lot of, lot of ways to do it. So I just wanna to touch up on one final thing here, and then we'll wrap up, is we also talked about the need for temperature testing, right? Well, it's important to note that uh, Keysight has a range of what we call extreme temperature probing solutions. And within that, then, these probes have the capability, there's high performance probes, and you can see where I've highlighted the high sensitivity current probes and the power rail probes. These probes can operate over a wide range of temperatures, 
uh, that usually uh, meet or exceed the temperature requirements that you'll be testing to so that you can put your product in the chamber and test it in the chamber and make sure that your power integrity is fine at high and low temperatures. So in summary, we talked about power rails are getting smaller and tighter tolerances to save power. They're also doing it so we can reduce the amount of power supply induced jitter in a system. We talked about where that noise comes from, those switching loads. Talked about the importance of a well-designed PDN then for doing things like uh, supplying the good power and not having EMI problems. We talked about our test flow and how you could use the built-in DVM for checking power good. We've got that mask on every channel and the auto mask um, for testing the uh, power of sequencing. And if you need to overflow to the digital channels, we've got infinite persistence. Talked about power rail quality and using power rail probes and also the power integrity analysis app and the power analysis app. And then we touched on current consumption and energy efficiency using the high sensitivity current probes. So that's what I've got for today. And um, I left a few minutes. So if, uh, Dave, if you want to moderate questions or if somebody's got a question, go ahead and speak up and I'll try to take some questions. And if there's no questions, we can just uh, wrap it up. Yeah, currently there's nothing in chat uh, that hasn't been answered. Um, um, one thing before we start into uh, any open session, I, I, uh, Leslie has a, a poll that she's going to put up for everyone. Um, if you would, wouldn't mind, um, uh, selecting one of the options in the poll. And then also um, afterward, after our Q&A session, we'll also be sending you um, a questionnaire. Uh, we, we look forward to hearing your feedback on the session, how useful the information was, and, and what you might like to see in future uh, webinars. Um, and of course, if there's any uh, need of a, a quote, or, or, or a demo, or you have additional questions, please note that down in the questionnaire as well. So we'll give it a, we'll give it a, a another minute or so here, or a few, few seconds actually, for everyone to answer their poll, and then we'll open sure. it up well, to that, questions. Yeah, while that's going on, I think uh, too, Dave, weren't you and Leslie saying that um, we'll make these uh, these slides available to Correct. people? So if they uh, if you want to reference some of those uh, formulas for like the, the impedance or the model numbers or uh, the, the math for PSRR or whatever, it's it's all in there for you. Yeah, Leslie will be sending out um, a copy of the slides as well as a, a, a recording of the session as well. Um, also, if you um, uh, have any any questions, feel free you know to reach out to me directly. I believe my information was my contact information was in the invite. Um, or reach out to one of your test equity um, reps. Um, they're always very willing uh, and able to help answer any questions you might have. Um, how are we looking, Leslie, if you want to? Great. Yep, I can close that down. Yeah. Yep. Great. Thank you, everyone, uh, for answering that. Um, so uh, I don't see anything, um, any additional questions in the chat. I know one thing that comes up, um, for those uh, customers, um, Kenny, that uh, that are budget strapped, uh, they like the idea of having you know the ability to measure eight rails at once. But what 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 if they don't have the budget for an eight channel scope right now? Uh, maybe touch on a little bit on um, what they can do. Uh, maybe they could purchase a four channel and upgrade. Yeah, you know it's um. Uh... It's fascinating to see how far we've come in scopes. I remember uh, when uh, upgrades meant you had to send, you know, like a bandwidth upgrade meant you had to send something back to the factory. Now with these particular scopes, uh, yeah, you could buy the, the four channel, 500 megahertz, you know, smallest memory kind of thing. And if you decided you needed more bandwidth, that's just a software key, more memory, that's a software key. If you wanted four more channels, that's even an upgrade. Now, clearly we don't, have the BNCs on there, you send it back to us, we just put in the uh, uh, the other acquisition set in there, but it's fully upgradable and um, which is which is helpful. And you know the other thing too that I find that's nice about it is it's true. I've for many, many years, I just used the uh, the four channels and I'd uh, kind of 
I'd use the DSO for some stuff almost as like a you know crippled analog channels, and you can do a lot with that. I'll warn you though, once you once you use an eight channel scope, even if you're not doing power stuff, you're going to be hooked. At least I was because it's nice. I'm not always having to unhook probes as I'm changing things up. So maybe I'm only using two channels for some timing measurement here, and I'm going to use a couple of different probes for some other measurement over there. And I can just leave all my probes hooked up and everything, and it saves me set up and tear down and everything. So I warn you, be careful. Don't try the eight channel. It's It'll hook you, uh, even if you're not doing power stuff. At least that's what it did to me. <laughs> well, another concern that tends to come up is if they if they're using eight channels, you know, with some scopes that degrades the bandwidth, degrades the sample rate, and so so forth. Now with the MXR and EXR, that's uh, that's not the case, correct? That's exactly right. You know, it used to be uh, with some of the scopes. You know, for example, when you looked at like a banner spec for a sample rate or bandwidth that was like on two of the four channels because they'd have to interleave to get bandwidth or they'd have to interleave to get memory depth and uh, we made a total departure from that with the MXR and the EXR so the specs you see are the specs for each channel and it can be all four or eight channels simultaneously there is no interleave there is no sharing for memory or bandwidth now the downside of that sounds like, oh, well, I can't interleave and get more memory, but we all know what's happened with memory. It's become more affordable in denser packages, so you can get substantial memory on the channels without the need to interleave. So there's none of these crazy kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, you know, uh, mm, half-baked modes or, you know, uh, uh, that you could kind of find yourself in. I've I've done that before with some of the older scopes where I'm doing something like that doesn't look right. Why is it doing that? And it's like oh, because I'm using yeah, I'm trying to sample it that fast and it turn this down or turn that up. So uh, it's it's crazy. I, I say it's crazy because first scope I worked on in R and D was well over 30 years ago, and it was going to be the world's first gigahertz digitizing oscilloscope and back then we were arguing in the lab on whether it would be whether you pronounced it gigahertz or gigahertz and that was a one gigahertz scope and now that there's real time and now that there's 110 gigahertz real time scopes out there and just how far they've come and how powerful and how easy to use and yeah the upgrade ability it's uh I'm I'm lucky that I work for a company that makes these. It'd be like if I worked for a car company and I went in and test drove new cars all the time. I'd always want a new car. So it's good that I can test drive these new ones because each time I try a new one, it's like, oh, yeah, I've got to have one of those and I can just have one on my bench and it's nice. But uh, um, anyway, so yeah, Dave, sorry about that. Thanks. You're, you're no. right. There's none of that, none of that crippled stuff. And then also the, uh, the multi instruments in one, you know, with the, uh, the DVM, the MSO, uh, we didn't touch on it, but uh, you know the this thing's got the super super fast update rate, um, so that uh, you can do things like uh, capture uh, glitches much faster. It's got a feature in there called Fault Hunter, which um, effectively the scope goes through and will learn your signal. It'll study your signal for say a minute, minute and a half, and make a series of measurements and build a statistical model of your signal and then it'll go off and go watch your signal and you can fill it for you know an hour a day a weekend whatever and it will capture what it thinks are outliers and anomalies and save those for you so you can see them so you can go through and and uh you know basically automate a lot of that testing go home over the weekend come back in and see did it find any weirdness so crazy how powerful and helpful they are one one, one final question ken um uh, what if a uh, customer, what if, what if someone wants to uh, measure more than eight channels? Uh, what kind of options do we have available for, say, multi-scope capability? Right, right. That's, that's good. You know, I do find that a lot of people, 12 to 20 is kind of a sweet spot. And um, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Uh, depending on the type of measurement, you could just take, uh, you know, any scope to kind of trigger out of one to trigger in on the other. Um, in the case of, uh, for the Keysight scopes, we've got a multi-frame or a multi-scope application. It's where you have a leader and a follower. And so the leader scope then is controlling the followers. And you can have up to 40 channels and you're controlling it all through the leader scope and it displays them all on that one graticule. 
and you can use an external display if you know if you got 40 channels and so you can uh, then go through and get timing measurements you know from one scope to another you can see all those relationships and and uh, it's got a calibration that'll run through so the timing skew is incredibly tight and small so if you've got something like that there's that application um, or you can just you know kind of do it old school like we did for a long time with trigger out and trigger in um, yeah all right fantastic well we're at, we're right at the top of the hour thank you kenny right. i appreciate um your help today i i want to thank everyone for for joining us today um and a special thanks to test equity uh who partnered and helped make this possible today as well uh again leslie will be sending out a copy of the slides and a recording of the uh, webinar um if you have any questions uh afterward please feel free to reach out um and again uh, you can go to keysight.com slash find slash exr or mxr to have a better closer look at the scope that we were using during the presentation uh thank you very much for joining us and have a wonderful and safe day thanks everyone